Hello and welcome to the second data visualization project. So this time what we're doing is creating a scatter plot graph. So we have to build a code pen app that looks like this. So we have two axes, one showing some years, the other showing some times that cyclists took to complete a course. And then we have these scatter plots that map the years to the time. And then when you hover over it, it shows some details about the cyclist. And it just shows which ones had doping allegations and which ones don't. And we have to fulfill these 15 user stories. So what we're going to do is first import the JSON data, which is stored right here. And then we are going to create an SVG canvas and then fulfill these user stories by drawing a scatter plot from this data. So first thing I'm just going to do is create a new folder. I'm just going to call it Scattergraph. And I'm going to open this up in Visual Studio Code so that we can get started. The first thing to do is just generating a skeleton project. So that's what we're going to do now. So first thing is just an index.html just to render everything into. And again with visuals, oops, I'm going to try that one again. So with Visual Studio Code, just press exclamation mark, enter, and it generates a HTML skeleton for you. And I'm just going to set the title here to scatter plot graph, like so. And I'm going to open this up in Live Server so that it automatically updates. So here we go. And what we also need to do is import the D3 library. So if I just go back to Chrome here and look for D3. There's a script tag right there, so we can just copy and paste it. We also need to import the free code cam test suite so that we can test our project and we can copy it from here. And I'm just going to put this after the body to make sure that we run this once our body has finished loading. Then I'm also going to create a script of our own. So I'm just going to call it script.js. And this is where we'll be writing all our code. And I'm going to load this after everything is loaded as well. So. going to set the source up like this and finally I'm just going to create a CSS style sheet so I'm just going to call it style.css and I'm going to create a link to it in the head so we can load our styling so style.css save that and now in the script, I'm just going to log the D3 object just to make sure we've imported D3 correctly. So let's have a look. One second. There we go. So we have D3 imported. We have the test suite imported as well. Now I'm going to be creating an SVG area within the body so that we have a canvas to work with and I'm going to just set the ID of this to canvas. I'm also going to set a few style properties really quick so we can see the canvas that we're working with. So I'm going to put the body display flex, um, flex direction, column, Justify, center, align, center. And I'm also going to set a background color for the SVG. I'm going to set this to, let's go with 
aqua. So if we save this now, we have an SVG canvas right here to work with. Perfect. So now, now that we've set up our project, it's time to create some variables and functions which we'll fill in as we go on throughout the project. So the first thing I'm going to do is just create a string called URL and I'm just going to point this to this JSON data right here. Next I'm going to create an object called let, uh, sorry let rec and this is going to be a new XML HTTP request and this is the method that we're going to use to import our JSON data in as a JavaScript object. I'm going to set values to be an empty array and we'll fill this with the data that we import with our request. I'm going to create a scale called x scale and this will be used to create our x axis as well as placing elements horizontally along the canvas. I'm going to create a y scale and this will be used to create the y-axis along the left as well as placing our dots vertically on the canvas. I'm going to create width and height which are just two numbers for now. So width is 800, height is 600 and I'm also going to create padding and these will be just the dimensions of our SVG canvas. I'm going to create a variable called SVG and set this to a D3 selection with the tag SVG. So this SVG right here, oops, this should be D3.select. This SVG right here will just return this SVG canvas right there so that we can just reference it very quickly. I'm also going to create some functions now. So draw canvas is just going to draw our canvas with the dimensions that we set. So I'm just going to fill this one in right now. So I'll say svg.attribute. I'm just going, to, just going to set the height and width for now. So we want to set width to width. And also we want to set the height to height. Okay. So then I'm also going to just create a few more functions, but I'm not going to fill them in now. So we're going to have one called generate scales. And this will be used to generate our X and Y scales. And what this will do is it'll set these to some linear and time scales that we can use later on. I'm going to create another function called draw points. And this will be used to plot the actual circle or dot points onto our graphs going to create one more called generate axis and what this will do is just draw the x and y axes onto our graph. So yeah now that we've created some functions and variables we can start by completing these and start doing the project. So now that we have an outline of our code, the next step will be to import this JSON data into a JavaScript array, which we can start using to draw our chart. So I'm going to be using the XML HTTP meth request method to import this. And I really recommend that you look at that challenge in the JSON APIs course to better understand what's happening here. So the first thing we need to do with this request that we created is open it up to set some properties. The first property is a string that gives, that's the argument given the method. And since we're fetching a JSON, this method is get. The second argument is a URL with the source of the data. And we've assigned it to this variable URL right here. So I can just give it URL. Finally, the third argument determines whether we want to run this asynchronously or not. And I'm going to put this to true so that it doesn't disrupt our code flow. Next thing to do is set the onload property. And remember onload is assigned to a function to run once the request has been completed and we have a response. And remember that once a request gets completed, the response text field gets filled in with whatever it got from the server. 
So I'm just going to be logging this now just to see what we're working with. So I'm going to put log rec.response text. Finally, we need to send off this request and I'm just going to run rec.send like this. So we'll open it. We've said the what told it what to do once we've got a, a response back and we've sent it off. So I'm going to save this now and go back to Chrome and see what's happened. So as you can see, we've got our response here and our response is already in an array format. So all we need to do is pass it. So instead of logging it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say let, sorry, not let, we already have a variable called values here set to an empty array. So I'm going to say values equals, and we want to pass this using json.pass into a JavaScript object. So we're going to be passing the response text that we saw right here into a JavaScript array and then setting this to values, this one right here. So next thing I'm just going to do is console.log the values array. Just to make sure that we've imported it correctly as an array. And now look, we actually have an array of JavaScript objects that we can start using. Okay, so after we've logged this, I'm going to just set the order that we want this code to be executed in. So the first thing we want to do is to draw the canvas. Then we want to generate the scales because the scales are used later on. Then we want to draw the points. I'm going to put an S here as well. And finally, we want to generate the axis. So this is the order we want it to go. So if I save that and run it now, what it's done is we've already got this draw canvas function filled in where it sets the width and the height. So we've just set the width and the height of our SVG area right here so that we know everything is working. Excellent. So I've just realized that when we set the style here, this align self right here should be align items. That's why it wasn't centering properly. So if I just save that and run it now, now that we have the SVG canvas in the center. So now that we've imported all our data and we've drawn our canvas, we can start fulfilling some of these user stories that we have here. And we'll start with user story one. So what we need to do is create a title element with the ID of title. So that's it. So this doesn't need to be created by D3. So I'm just going to hard code this into our HTML right here. And remember in SVG, we can render text using a text element. And we have to set the ID equal to title right here. So I'm going to set this equal to title. And I'm also going to set an X and Y value so that we can draw it into the canvas. But you will have to experiment with this to try and get it somewhat near the center. So I'm just going to set the X to 150 and the Y to 20. And finally, I'm going to fill in the title to give it some actual text. So I'm just going to put doping in professional bicycle racing like this. So if we save that now, we've got a title right here. So I'm just going to move it a little bit more. So I'm just going to put it to maybe 250 along the X. Yep. So now we've kind of generated our title in the center. And if we look here, we have a text with ID of title. So that should be everything for user story one. So let's try running it. And yeah, we've completed user story one. Excellent. So let's look at user story two now. And what it wants us to do is to create an X axis with the ID of X axis. And to do this, we first need to start looking at creating this X scale right here. Now, since we are working with years along the bottom, and if we look at the array right here, the year is just represented as a number, we can just use a linear scale for this. So I'm just going to say let, so we already have X scale defined up here. So I'm going to say X scale is d3.scale linear. And we're just going to set the range for now because we just want the axis just to appear. And if we look at the range, 
of where we want the axes to be. We want the minimum x of the points and the axes to be about here. So we want this much padding. Remember we said a padding of 40, so we want padding here. So that's the minimum value we want the range to be. So we have padding as the minimum. And if we look at the maximum, we want it to be about here. So we want to leave this much padding here. So that'll be width, which is the width of the SVG area, take away padding. So I'm going to put width take away padding here. Now if we come down to the generate axis method, we can create a new axis called x-axis and we can set this to d3 dot. And since we want the labels or the ticks to be at the bottom of the axis when it's along here, we're going to call axis bottom. And to this we have to give it a scale and we have this x scale right here. So next we need to create the axis on the canvas and to do this we need to create an SVG group element and the axis just returns a set of SVG elements and we want to put it into this group element. So we want to append SVG with a new group element so I'm going to call append with G and we want to call so when we call it'll create the set of SVG elements and it'll place it inside this group and we want to call x axis on this and finally we want to give it the attribute of id and we want this id to be if we look over here this id should be x dash axis so i'm going to put x dash axis like this so if we save that now we have an axis right here don't worry about the labels on the axis we'll fix that later so what we need to do also is we kind of want to move it into position so if we look at the x the x seems to be okay like we have the padding on either side but the y needs fixing and we want to move this down or translate it by height down so remember positive y means down in svg so we want to move it down by height and then push it back up by padding so it sits about here and we have this padding so we want to give it a transform attribute. So I'm going to say attribute transform. And the transformation we want to give it is a translation. So translate. And it has to be zero on the x-axis because we're fine for the x-axis. And we want to push it down by height, take away padding. So remember, we're pushing it down by height and then pushing it up by padding. So height, take away padding on the y and then I'm just going to close off this. So we have translate 0 comma height minus padding. So if we save that now, we've got the axis in roughly the correct position. So if we look here, we have a g which the id of x axis created. So that should be everything for user story 2. So let's run the test and see. And yeah, we have a G element with ID X axis. Perfect. So let's now look at fulfilling user story four. And what we need to do for this is to do the same thing we did before, but this time we are creating a Y axis. So the first thing we need to do is create a Y scale. And when we're using the Y scale, it's gonna be times along the left here. And to do that, we have these seconds right here. So we're going to be working with converting these into minutes and seconds to create a time axis. So what we want to do is when we are generating a Y scale, we want to, to use a scale time instead. We don't have to worry about the domains for now. So I'm just going to put Y scale as d3.scale time. And we're also going to set the range. So where do we want our largest time to be in terms of the axes and in terms of the dots? So the largest time is the longest time and that needs to be at the very bottom. So the longest time should be mapped to the bottom because in terms of times, the shorter the time, the better. So the shortest time should go up here and the longest time should go here. So wherever time is the longest, so that'll be the largest time, we want it to be here at height takeaway padding. 
So the maximum in the range is height takeaway padding. This will become clear once we start drawing the graph. And in terms of the shortest time, the shortest time should go near the top right here. And that'll be at just padding. So we need to move it down Y by padding. So to summarize, the range for the Y axis and the Y points is the longest time is at the bottom here at height takeaway padding. And the shortest time is at the top here at padding. So let's create a Y axis with this now. So I'm just going to say let Y axis equals g3 dot axis and this time we want the text to be on the left side of the line so it is going to be an axis left and we're going to give it this y scale that we created and then we need to create a group element to contain this so i'm just going to put svg dot append and I'm going to append a G here and then we're going to call the X call the Y axis to create the Y axis within this G and finally I'm going to give it the ID like they said so I'm going to give an attribute ID and the ID they wanted is Y dash axis like this so I'm just going to give that now so if we save that and have a look we have the y-axis coming up here and yeah the range is correct so we have it ready to be lined up with this perfectly so the only thing we need to do is move it to the right and we need to move it to the right so it aligns with this and this distance right here is padding so we need to give it a transformation to translate it right by padding so let's do that so first we need to set the transformation attribute so I'm going to call the attribute method and it's going to be a transform and the instruction we want to give it is translate and we want to move it along the x-axis remember positive x is to the right so we want to move it to the right by padding so we want to move it along the x-axis by padding and then in terms of the y-axis the vertical alignment is correct so we just want to give it zero so we want to move it by padding comma zero so if I save that now, we've pushed the y-axis just over here. Now don't worry about what's on the left, these ticks right here, we'll fix this shortly. But we have just created an element now with the ID of y-axis, so that should be enough to pass user story 3. So let's test it and have a look. And yeah, we've passed user story 3 now. Brilliant. So let's look at fulfilling user story for now. And what we need to do is create some circles or dots that have a class of dot and represent the data being plotted. So for each of these elements in the array, we want to be creating a circle or a dot and then putting this onto the graph. So this is what we'll do in the draw points method. And first thing we want to do is to associate circles in the SVG canvas with the data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select all rectangles and sorry, select all circles. And the name for an SVG circle element is just circle. And I'm going to bind it to this values array that we have here. And to do this, I'll call the dot data method and I'm going to put values here. So each of these is now associated with a circle element. Then I'm going to call the enter method to specify what to do when we have an array element without a circle element, which is all of these in this case. And what we want to do is we want to create a new circle element. So I'm going to append with a new circle. And they said they wanted the class of the circle to be dot. So I'm going to set the attribute class to dot. And finally, I'm also just going to set a radius, which with the attribute R of five, just so we can see them. So if I save that now and have a look, we have these circles in the top left corner. Now they're there because we haven't placed them 
But if we look at the SVG canvas now, we have a circle with a class of dot for each of the elements in this array. And that should be user story for completed. So I'm going to test it now. Oops. So there we go. So we've completed user story for now. So let's have a look at user story five now. And what it says is each dot should have the property data dash x value and data dash y value containing their corresponding x and y values. So what we need to do is for each of these circles, we need to create some attributes with data x value and data y value. So the first thing to do is create a new attribute with data, I'm gonna copy and paste it just to make sure. So data x value. And we can give this a function that takes in one of the items in the array. And I'm just gonna return item for now. And finally, we're gonna create a data y value. So this will be data dash y value. And again, I'm going to give it a function that takes an item. As far as I'm aware for this test, it doesn't matter what you return. So I'm just going to return item again. So if we have a look now in all our circle elements, we have a data X value and a data Y value field. So let's run the test now. And yeah, so we've completed user story five now. And we're gonna look at filling these in correctly next. So let's look at actually filling in these data values correctly now. And to do that, we'll complete user story six. So what we have to do is set the data X value and the data Y value to be within the range of the actual data and in the correct format. So for data X value, we need to give it an integer which represents the year. And for data Y value, we have to give it the time that they took, but we have to do it as a JavaScript date object. So what we're gonna be doing is changing what we return here. So for data X value, it says that it should be the number of year of the year, which, should, which will be represented as an integer. And if we look here, the actual year for each array item is stored in a property called year. So we can just use this number right here. So here for data X value, if we give it a function that takes an item from the array, what we wanna do is set this to item and then year like this. Now in terms of data Y value, what they want to do is they want you to use a date object. And a data object in JavaScript has to take in a number of milliseconds. So we have these this field called seconds here, and this is basically this time in seconds, and we can make use of this. So since we need to return a date object, what we'll do is we can say return new date like this. So this is how we construct a date object. And then if we give it item seconds, so we give it the number of seconds that they took. And then if we multiply this by a thousand, we can convert this into milliseconds. So what we have here is the time that the cyclist took in milliseconds, and we've created a new date with that. So if I save that now, so if we look at the circle elements, one second, so they have a year value set correctly now, and we have the date set, which is telling it how long they took. So let's try running that now. And yeah, we've passed user story six now, since we're using years in the data X value and data objects in the data Y value. So let's look at completing user story seven now. And what it says is the data X value and its corresponding dot should align with the corresponding point or value on the X axis. So what we essentially need to do is set the X coordinates of these dots so they're positioned correctly along the X axis horizontally. So we wanna start 
improving our scale a little bit. So we need to give it a domain because if we look at the bottom right now, the numbers just go from 0 to 0 0.1. So there's no way that these can line up correctly on the scale. So we need to actually make the scale use these years that need to go along the bottom. So we're going to start off by calling the domain method on the scale. And the domain method takes in an array of the minimum and maximum domain. And since we're working with years, we want the minimum domain to be the minimum year right here. So to do this, I'm going to call the d3.min method. And I'm going to give it firstly the array that we're working with as the first argument, which is values. And as the second argument, I'm going to tell it where to look for the minimum from. And since we're working with years, we want to look it to look in the year field. So I'm going to say return item year. So next we need to set the maximum. And again, we were looking for the maximum year. So I'm going to call d3.max. And in this, I'm going to give it a function. Uh, sorry, I'm going to give it the array as the first argument and a function to, to tell it where to look as a second argument. And again, we're looking at the maximum year. So we want to select or return item year. So what it will do now is it will look through all of these year fields and it will select the maximum and the minimum year. So if we look at the axes now, we have the correct range now. So it goes from 1994 to about 2015. Now there will be a problem when we align these with the x axis and that's because these numbers have a comma in it so it won't match. So we need to get rid of this comma. So what we essentially need to do is apply some formatting to, to each of these ticks here. And to do this uh, we can call a method called a tick format on the x-axis. So we have the x-axis right here. So what I'll do is I'll call a method here called dot tick format like this. And what this does is it takes a D3 format. So to generate a D3 format, we'll just do D3 dot format like this. And we give it a formatting argument in here. And I'm going to give it D here. And what D means is just means decimals. So it'll round whatever value we have on the ticks to a decimal or an integer. So if I save this now, you can see that the years have been set without the comma now. So they're actually proper numbers we can work with. So the final thing to do is set the x axis of each of the dots correctly. And in a circle, it's the CX attribute that determines the X coordinates. So we need to set this CX attribute. And I'm going to give it a function that takes in one of the items from the array. And what we wanted to do is to use this X scale that we created. So we needed to take in a year. So we have a domain of minimum to maximum year. And we wanted to return an X value in the correct range, which is between padding and width minus padding. So what I'm going to do is return, and then I'm going to call X scale as a function. And we can give this a year. And the year is stored in the year field of each item here. So I'm going to give it item and then year like this. So if I save that and run it, we can see that the points have been spread out correctly along the X axis. And if we look at the elements, you can see that the CX has been set to an, a value in the appropriate range that represents the year. So I'm going to try testing this now. And if we have a look, we've passed user story seven. So the data X value aligns correctly with the X axis. So if we look at user story eight now, what we have to do is align the data Y value and the corresponding dot to the correct place on the Y axis. So we basically need to set the Y coordinates of all of these dots. And if we look at the Y scale right now, we can see that the scale needs to be adapted because right now the times here are not making sense because if we look at these times, these are all in minutes and seconds and this is some weirdly random scale. And that's because we haven't set the domain yet. So we need to set the domain of the scale that the Y axis uses and tell it to use these times right here. So let's do that. 
So we're working with a scale time here, which means that the domain has to be date objects. So the minimum domain would be the minimum, I guess, seconds that we take in. And that's going to, if we're going to be using the seconds field right here. And we're going to convert these into date objects to give in as the inputs for our domain. So we want to select the minimum date or the minimum seconds from here. So let's do that. So firstly, I'm going to call the d3.min method. I'm going to give it the array that we're working with, the values. And I'm also going to tell it where to look here. So what we want to do is when we're calling a scale time, we have to give it a date object. And what we can do is generate a date object from the number of seconds right here. So we want to return a new date and we want to give it item seconds like this. But remember that date objects require milliseconds. So we have to multiply this by a thousand. So what we do is for each of these seconds, we convert, we multiply it by a thousand, turn it into milliseconds, generate a date with it, and then pick out the minimum date. Now we need to set the maximum date, and this is a very similar process. So it's going to be d3.max. We're going to give it the array values, and we're going to give it a function to tell it where to look for the maximum date. And this time, we also want to return a new date, and we want to give it the number of seconds they took, and we want to convert this into milliseconds. So to recap once more, what it will do is it will multiply each of these seconds by a thousand to convert them into milliseconds, generate a date object from them, and select the minimum and maximum date objects to set as the minimum and maximum for our Y scale. So if I save this now, we've got some weird time format again. And that's because we haven't formatted the times along the y-axis, which is what we need to do. So again, we need to call the tick format method here. And since we need to give this a D3 format, but since we are working with a time, we need to call, give it D3.time format instead. And in the time format, you give it a string specifying how you want a time to be displayed. So remember, we're working with date objects along here. So what it'll do is tell it how to display this. And we want to give it in the form of minutes, colon, seconds. So I'll put percentage and then big M to say, to tell it to render the minutes. Then I'll put a colon like this. Then I'll put percentage and big S and then tell it to render the seconds. So it should render the data objects in the form of minutes and then seconds. So if I save this now, we have the times correctly. And if we look at the times in the array, you can see that the range is about correct. So it goes from like 36.50 to like 39.50. So we know we're working with the correct times now. Now the final thing we need to do is actually set the Y coordinate of these dots so that they're correctly aligned on the Y axis. And to do this, we need to set the CY attribute that circles use to determine their Y coordinate. So I'm gonna set the CY here and I'm gonna give it a function that takes in an item from the array. And we want to give it this, this time here. So we have the seconds field with the time. But remember that a scale time, which we're using, can only take in a date object. So we need to convert this into a date. And again, we want to return. So I'm gonna call the Y scale because we want it to take in a date and we want it to return a Y value in the correct range. So between padding here and then height minus padding here. So I'm going to return y scale and I'm going to create a new date here. And I want to create the new date with item and then we're going to use the seconds and we're going to times it by 1000 to convert into milliseconds. So to recap once more, what we're doing is converting this into milliseconds, creating a date object from that, 
giving this to our scale to determine a y coordinate in the correct range. And if we look now, they have been spread out along the y axis and it shows the correct y coordinates. So I'm going to try running the test now. And if we have a look now, we've actually fulfilled user story 8. Amazing. So let's look at user story 9. And what user story 9 says, we want tick labels on the y axis with the minutes and then seconds format. And if we look at the code here, we already did this in the last challenge. So we told you to set the tick format. And what we want to do is uh, render the date as a time format with minutes, which is this percentage capital M, colon seconds. So that's exactly the format that they wanted us to use. So if we had to look at our test, we could see that we've already passed user story 9. So let's take a quick look at user story 10 now. What it says is they want to see multiple tick labels on the x axis that show the year. And if we look, we already have that. And this is because we assigned the x axis to the x scale, which takes in times, which takes in years, sorry. So, and then we formatted it with the D here to convert it back into integers. So what it does is it just renders all the years. So it has a domain which takes in all of these year fields and it's rendered them along the bottom here. And if we take another look at our tests, we can see that we've already completed this. So taking a quick look at user story 11, it says, I can see the range of the x-axis label are within the range of the actual x-axis data. And if we look at the years, the years go from like 1995 to like 2014 or 2015 or something. And this automatically happens because again, we used the X scale in here and that already looks at the minimum and maximum year. So we'll have the correct range of years along the bottom. Now I'm gonna make a little tweak to this because as you can see, a lot of these values stretch to the very end of the graphs. So I'm gonna shrink this in a bit. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just make the domain to be one year less and the range to, sorry, the minimum domain to be one year less and the maximum domain to be one year more. So we'll start from 1993 and end at 2016. So what I'm just gonna do is where we selected the domain and we have returned the minimum year, I'm just going to, right here, so we have to return the minimum year, I'm just going to take away one. And where we selected the maximum year, I'm just going to add one. So if I save that now, we can see that the scale starts from 1993 and goes to 2016. And we have less of these points along the edges. Hopefully this hasn't affected our test. So if we have a look, we can see that user story 11 has still been completed. So that's all right. And it looks a bit nicer. So user story 12 is another one that we've already completed, but I'm just gonna take a quick look at it again. And what it says is the range of the Y axis labels are within the range of the y-axis data. And the y-axis data we're working with is these times in seconds right here. And you can see that this happens automatically because we used this y-scale, which uses our minimum and maximum range of times in converted into dates. And then we've used this very scale right here in our y-axis, which is why we have the shortest time of 3650 all the way here and then we have the longest time of like 3950 down here and you can see the range of the axes is equal to the range of the values because none of these dots go past where these axes are. So again if we look at the test we can see that we've already completed user story 12. So now I'm gonna make a little tweak before we move on to user story 13. And if we look at this graph, this graph is all about doping in professional racing, but none of the data right here so far shows this. And if we look at our elements, we can see that some of these people have doping allegations and there's usually a URL to match this data. And we need to show a way, we need some kind of way to show whether these cyclists had a doping allegation or not. And to do this, I'm going to change the fill or the color of these depending on whether this is true or not. So what I'm gonna do is in the circle, I'm gonna set a fill attribute like this. 
and again it's going to take in a function it's going to have a function that takes in one of the items and the way we determine whether a doping has taken place or alleged doping is whether we have this URL field right here and if you look on this one there is a URL field but the I'm not sure which ones they are but some of them so if we look at the one here in 2000 and 15 if I try and find it yeah 2015 there are no allegations here and the URL field is empty we can also do the same with the doping field as well because the doping field is empty so what I want to do is if there has been a doping allegation I'm gonna make it orange and if there hasn't I'm gonna make it green so here when we're returning a color I'm gonna say if item doping which is the text field right here and if that's an empty string if that's not an empty string it means there is a doping allegation so if item doping is not equal to an empty string then we want to return and we want orange otherwise if if it is an empty string we want to return light green so what it'll do is for when we're setting the fill for each of these, it'll look to see whether there is a doping allegation or not and set it to orange or light green accordingly. And now you can see the ones that don't have doping allegations are in light green. It's kind of hard to see, but we'll change the background at some point. And the ones that do have allegations are orange like this. So what I've quickly gone ahead and done is I've said change the background color to white smoke just so we can see these greens a bit easier so let's look at user story 13 and what it says is I can see a legend containing descriptive text that has the ID of legend so we just need to specify what these axes show and what these colors show and to do this I'm just going to create a div here to store our information so if I go to index back to index and I'm just going to create a div just under the SVG canvas and I'm going to give it an ID of legend like they specified and inside it I'm going to put some information so I'm going to first give it the um, what the axes are showing so I'm going to put year x versus time y like this um, I'm going to give it a new line after that oops that should be br so I'm going to give it a new line after this and then I'm going to say what the colors are. So I'm going to say orange equals doping allegation. And then I'm going to put a pipe symbol here. There we go. And then I'm also going to put green equals no doping allegation. So if I save that now, we have this ID. So if we look under the SVG, we have a div with the ID of legend that gives some descriptive text. So that's, to be honest, all you need to do is create a div with the ID of legend. You don't even have to write anything in it. So let's try running the test now. And yeah, we've got user story 13 all completed. So let's look at user story 14 now. And what it says is I can mouse over an area. By area, they just mean a dot. And I can see a tooltip with an ID of tooltip, which displays more information. So what we want to do is we'll create a div here called tooltip that's invisible. And when we mouse over some of these dots, it becomes visible and then displays some information about what it shows. So first thing I'm going to do is underneath the legend, I'm going to create a div with the ID of tooltip like this. I'm not going to put anything in for now. Next thing I'm going to do is set it to be invisible by default. So if I do, if I do so div like this, tooltip, and I'm going to set its invisibility, this is CSS, um, to hidden. And I'm gonna also gonna set its width and height to auto. Ah, 
having a hard time with the keyboard. Okay, so next I'm going to, where we selected the SVG canvas here, I'm also going to select the tooltip and I'm just going to say let tooltip equals and in d3.select we can just give it a CSS selector as well so it's just going to be tooltip like this so we now have this tooltip area to work with then what we want to do is we want to make the tooltip visible when we put our mouse cursor over it so on the circle we want to create a mouse over event so I'm going to say dot on and then mouse over and then I can give it a function to run that takes in one of the items in the array and the first thing we want to do is make the tooltip visible so what we'll say is tooltip and we can call the transition method so the transition means we're going to change the style of it and then we want to set the style to, if we look at the previous project, I think I explained this in a bit more detail. So I'm going to put the visibility to visible. Okay, so next what we're going to do is set the text of the tooltip. And we, I, we want to display, so if we look at these elements, this is just my personal choice, it's your choice what you display here. So we have some information and what I want to do is I want to show the year, the person and where their time and whether they had any allegations. So the the whether they had any allegations part is important. So if they so firstly we're gonna look at if they did have allegations. And to do this we're gonna say if item doping is not equal to an empty string so they did have a doping allegation so it's the same kind of thing that we did here we want to set the tooltip text so tooltip dot text remember the d3 text method sets what goes inside the element so what goes inside this div and we want to set this to a few things to show a few things so we first want to show the year and then I'm going to just put a dash with some spaces and then I'm going to show their name so I'm going to put item name like this and then I'm going to show their time so item and the time we're going to go with is the actual time because it's already in a string for us so I'm going to say item time so we have year and name time and then finally I'm going to put another space in a dash and I'm going to put their doping field which shows the details of the allegations so I'm just going to put this into a new line just so we can see it easier. So we send the text to the year, the name, the time, and the doping allegations. Then we want to look for the case where there isn't an allegation. And to do this, I'm just going to copy and paste this in. And we want to render everything apart from the allegation. So if I just paste this in right here, the only thing we want to get rid of is after the time, we can just say something like we can just give a string here that says no allegations finally we want to make sure that this tooltip disappears when we move our mouse out so i'm going to say dot on mouse out so mouse out means we aren't hovering over the circle anymore so we, when we move our mouse out of it and what we want to do is just simply this one's a lot easier we just want to set the we want to transition it back to make the visibility hidden so if I just copy this and paste it in here we just want to make the visibility hidden so now if we have a look if we put our mouse cursor over it we can see that we get some text along the bottom here that says the details so we have the year the name the time and then what happened so yeah so what we've essentially created is an is a 
area with an ID of tooltip that shows when we hover over a circle. Again, the text inside doesn't matter. You just have to make it show when you put the mouse over and then hide when you take the mouse out. So let's run the test now. And yeah, we've passed user story. Well, it's it's called user story 14 here, but it's 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 called a tooltip text here. But yeah, regardless, yeah, that's all we needed to do. Okay, so we're almost done now. So we just have user story 15 left. And what it says is the tooltip needs to have a data year property, which is just an attribute that's the same as the data x value. So to do this, we can just simply use the attribute method on tooltip whenever we mouse over it. So we can just say tooltip. So this is in the mouse over of a circle. And we can say tooltip dot attribute. And we want to set the data year attribute. And remember, we're already working in a function that takes in an item. So if we look at how we set the data x value, we can see that we simply returned item year. We've already taken in the item here on the mouse over function. So we can just set this to item year. Now if I save it and look at the tooltip now, we can see that the data year attribute gets set to wherever I point my mouse cursor. So that should be user story 15 completed, fingers crossed. And yes, we have finished this entire project and everything is fully functional now. So what I'm going to do is just go, and go ahead and apply some styling and come back. So what I've just done is I've just added some CSS now to just make it look a little bit better. So I've just made the background more of a white. I've put the SVG canvas into a purple color so that we can kind of see the oranges and greens a bit better. And I've set the text color and I've centered the text and stuff like that. Um, I've also added a hover effect so that when we put our mouse cursor over it, the color changes. And yeah, I think this looks a little bit better and we can see stuff a bit easier now. So yeah, the tooltip is still working. And I think that should be everything. So the test should still work, hopefully exactly the same. And yeah, everything's working. So what I'm going to do is I'll also put the source code into the description just so that if you get stuck, you can just have a look and then follow along. And yeah, thank you for watching.